um, during this session. So if you just want to just do a round, you just say sort of where you are and um, and who you are, really, that'd be great. Magda, do you want to start? Mm. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Magda Joshi and I'm a member of the Philanthropy Partnerships and Engagement team here at UWC Atlantic. I've been in my post for about a year. I'm a graduate of uh, UWC Adriatic 2003, um, originally from Poland. And in this project week, I've been supporting the team in making sure uh, we, have, uh, we are in contact with uh, alumni and everyone knows uh, what's going on. Thank you very much. Magda, maybe, maybe as we go around, um, we could all sort of introduce ourselves and then also say what you're going to be doing within this meeting, like as in muting, unmuting, you know, what, what's each of our roles for the purposes of this conversation as well? Of course. So uh, my role is uh, the convener. So um, I'm helping to, yes, to mute and unmute people and to make sure everyone knows uh, what's, uh, what's happening and at what time during the Alumni Project Week. Thank you, Katie. Going and I'm, I'm going to be facilitating alongside Katie. Do you want to introduce yourself, Katie? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Katie Marks. Um, I'm an ex-student alumni um, from Atlanta College, 95-97, and together with um, Jack Fairweather, who's just joined us, um, we um, decided to initiate this, um, this idea of the Alumni Project Week, really to just get um, to find more um, varied ways in which um, students and alumni could come together and talk about the future of the college rather than it just be about sort of, you know, reunions, fundraising dinners and things like that. We wanted to find more creative ways in which we could come together and still feel part of the UWC community. So for this um, meeting, um, together with Sean, just sort of facilitating some of this conversation. Thanks, Ewan. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Ewan. I'm part of the Philanthropy Partnerships and Engagement team, um, and I'm also an alumni of Atlantic College. I graduated in 2016, um, and I'm just going to be helping Magda with any way I can, um, muting and unmuting people and stuff like that, and just keeping an eye on things generally. Um, but if you have any questions um, and you don't want to speak up, you can direct it on the chat and I'll, I'll try and um, answer it in any way I can. Thank you, Kato. Hello, um, I'm Kato. I am, um, well, I'm a second year now at AC, which is kind of crazy, but um, I'm in Amsterdam right now. Um, and I am part of the new generation of the last project. Um, and I will be here to listen. And contribute, I'm sure. Essie? Hi, I'm Essie. I'm from Thailand. I'm also a second year at AC. So I know about this project week because I'm one of the FNL leader. So I'm just here to listen and share the ideas with others. Thank you. Kami? Uh, hello, I'm Cami Harbottle. I live in Tallinn, Nova Scotia. I am a graduate of Pearson College uh, uh, in 1998-2000. And I'll be speaking a little bit about my experience with uh, farming and adult education. Great. Graham? Graham, um, I'm certainly responsible for ruining Kato's English. I'm apparently responsible for ruining her Dutch. Um, <laughs> And um, my role in this, I think, is to listen carefully, take some notes and um, think through some of the ideas that are thrown out in this conversation. Lovely. Thank you, Sam. Or Ned, as you're called in this call. How's that? Better. Hi everyone, I'm Sam. Um, I'm the co-curricular coordinator here um, at AC as well as a house parent for Whitaker. So a quick hello to Sophia and IC. Um, and uh, my, my main role here is similar to Graham to listen to the ideas 
Um, thank you. Um, have a cup of tea and um, just um, see how we can work some of these ideas into the valley, the service um, and into the whole school ethos. Lovely. Thanks, Sam. And Alice, also known as Tom. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Alice from Wales, but I now live in London. Um, I'm an urban farmer um, and I'm going to talk today a bit about my experience of running an urban farm um, and how some of it might be useful for the valley, hopefully. Um, I graduated from AC in 99, a long time ago. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Sophia? Um, so, uh, I'm Sophia, I come from Italy and I'm a current second year, um, second year of AC and I'm here to listen. Yeah. I'm part of the last project, yeah, last generation of last project. Wonderful, thank you. Mickey? Hi everyone, I am Mickey. I've been working with various wonderful students like <laughs> Sophia and Kato and uh, Ben um, doing the Land and Sea Stewardship Project over the last three years um, and I'm really curious. I couldn't make the project week last year and I heard a lot of really good stuff. So I'm here to listen to see what can kind of feed into this project and what we can also maybe feed in from the work we've been doing and yeah, curious. I'm also an alumni. I graduated in 2011 um, from Atlantic College and then I was teaching there in 2018 and working kind of remotely and on a part-time basis with the school since then. Lovely. Thanks, Mickey. Jack? Jack, you're muted. All right. Hi. Oh, and the video's off now as well. There we go. I get there. Um, hi, I'm, I, I'm an alumni of AC from 95, 97. <coughs> I've been working with Katie to set up the alumni uh, project week. I think Katie spoke very eloquently as to um, why, we're, why we're doing that. And I'm so thrilled that we're all on the call today. Thanks, Jack. Ed? Hi, I'm Ed. I'm the music teacher at AC and I am taking over leading LAS from Mickey. So I'll be leading that next year and I'm going to be taking notes during the session. Thanks, Ed. Tanya? Hi there. So um, for all those alumni, I think they're old. I'm 1984 and every now and again I keep putting 1982 because I'm dyslexic and twos and fours are synonymous with each other. So I'm a lot older than any other alumni so far. Um, I was AC alumni and um, yeah, I'm just to listen. I've, I, I've not made one of these project weeks before. Um, I'm originally from Zimbabwe, but I am at the moment now um, in Manchester, United Kingdom. So here to listen and learn. You're very welcome, Tanya. Thanks for joining us, Rachel. Rachel, you're muted. Oh, the other way. Should we come back to... Are you there, Rachel? We'll Rachel? come back to you, Rachel. Are you there? I think we should be able to hear Rachel. She's unmuted now. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Rachel did message us last night saying she had had really bad internet. So oh, okay. Okay. Okay, she's having problems with the mic. We've got a message there. Okay, well, you're very welcome, Rachel. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Kate? Hi, sorry for not <laughs> uh, putting the camera on. Uh, my name is Kate Winter. I'm Vice Principal Education. I'm responsible for academic, co-curricular and well-being slash pastoral. I met I think most of you, uh, uh, because I, I was there for the alumni project week last year. I'm just listening. Thanks. And Ben? Um, hi, I'm Ben. I'm a current student at AC and I'm part of Mickey's last group. So I'm yeah, here to listen. Welcome, Ben. Ashwin, nice of you to join us.
Ashwin, I'm sorry, I'm unable to unmute you. If you don't mind hovering over the Yes, there we go. Thank you. Hi, Ashwin. Welcome. We're just, we're just doing a quick introduction, if you just joined, just um, who you are, where, where you are in the world, and what you're doing here today. Oh, we, we can't seem to hear you. Hi, Sean. Hi, yeah. Sorry, I was a bit late. The system decided to reboot and do several things I, which I don't understand. So yeah. we're just um, we're just doing quick introductions um, of ourselves, um, Ashwin. Just in terms of who we are and where um, where we are in the world. So should I go now? Yeah, please do. So um, I'm Ashwin Paranspe. I am from India, from a city called Pune, which is on closer to the coast of India. Um, I teach environmental systems and societies at UWC Mahindra College. And I have been part of the organic farming movement here in Pune and have been, uh, was instrumental in, in starting a community supported agriculture program uh, here near close to my city. Um, yeah, that's my brief introduction. And I'm, I'm really excited to see how Atlantic College can go back to the land, start farming um, yeah, from me. Thank you, Ashwin. We look forward to hearing from you a bit more uh, through this session. Um, Richard, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, there we are, just LinkedIn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Dunn, and uh, I'm not an alumni of Atlantic College, but I'm delighted to be here. Um, I used to be a state primary school <laughs> Uh, where we did a lot of food growing, organic food growing. And now I run something called the Harmony Project, which is part of the Sustainable Food Trust, uh, Patrick Holden's Sustainable Food Trust. So delighted to be here. Very nice to see you, Alice. And, uh, and good to know that Ben Holden is also on the line. So uh, yeah, look forward to uh, sharing in this conversation. Wonderful. Thanks, Richard. I'm just going to share my screen with people and then um, sort of explain the format of what we're going to be doing today. Um, obviously, the chat is open. Um, Ewan is, is moderating that. If you want to speak, then you can just do so by uh, putting your name into, um, into the chat. And we'll go through a few more protocols as we, um, as we, as we move forward. Um, So um, I just wanted to give a, bit, a little bit of background really about the context of, of where we are and, and what we're doing um, today because we've been on a journey this year at Atlantic College to reimagine the curriculum and what it might look like and how it could come to life in this beautiful environment that we have um, here. And um, so many people have put so much energy um, into this and we've come up with kind of three broad pathways and um, one around sort of social change and systems leadership and one around um, peacemaking and another around broadly around sustainability and we're going to have 10 change maker courses running next year and um, three of which have been prototyped and piloted this year already and um, some of you might have heard the students and uh, colleagues who have been involved in the last program um, speaking about that already. LAST stands for land and, uh, and uh, originally stood for land and sea stewardship and we're broadly thinking of it in terms of land sustainability now. And, you know, that's kind of one of our kind of emblematic projects, really. And what we found, I think, and what I've noticed um, this year as we've started to have these really deep curriculum conversations is how energising they are. And that's why I've got a picture of sunflowers here, because, you know, there's something beautiful about the heliotropic nature of sunflowers, you know, the way they open up to the sun. And, um, and this process of curriculum development that we've been through is very much follows that mould. You know, what I've noticed is myself and, and, and colleagues kind of opening up to a new process which is much more agile um, and much more meaningful really in terms of how we can conceive the way in which young people learn here. Um, it's full of potential, it's full of huge potential and the purpose of today's session is to think about how some of the underlying principles of that might come to life. You know it's a process that affords 
lots of input from lots of diverse sources. And one of the beautiful features, I think, of the last few months has been the way in which alumni have come into the conversation and shared their talents and expertise and wisdom, um, both in terms of how we can shape things and, and also in terms of their experience and what they can contribute. And when we started to plan this um, alumni project week, some, um, I guess about six weeks ago, you know, Katie and Jack kind of jumped into the frame and, and really came up with some, some, some very resonant um, principles and, and perspectives um, that really spoke to what we're trying to do here. And I'd like to pass over really to Katie to, to frame that in the context of sustainability at the college and place-based learning, because what's come out of this is a beautiful statement that is on the Alumni Project Week website that I think Katie's going to draw um, from as she talks us through that. And um, that provides for us today, I think, a broad framing of the conversations that happen. And we'll talk about structure and how we do that um, in a moment. But I'll just pass over to you, Katie, really to think about some of those lovely words and thoughts that have been framing our, our, our thinking over the last few weeks. Thanks, Sean. Um, just, to, um, just to acknowledge that I know some of you have been involved in some of these conversations over the last couple of weeks. So um, I'm, I'm sort of conscious that some people haven't heard any of these discussions and some people have heard lots of these discussions. So, you know, there may be a little bit of repetition in what I'm just about to say. I won't read the whole thing out because I think from the discussion, you'll all get a sense of the, of the kind of things that we're trying to say. But just to give you a little flavour. So um, today we, we called it an insight session because we wanted to gain insight from people within, both within and outside our UWC community uh, to learn from their experiences. Um, but I just wanted to be really clear that that is not just in practical terms about, you know, how do we set up uh, an agriculture food growing project in an educational environment or, or, or something like that, but also to really, really step back and think about how this um, might affect our model of education and our model of learning um, and how we really take that to the core of, of what we do as, as a UWC movement. So I just wanted to read a couple of little excerpts from, from the sort of statement that we put out about what the, uh, the project week is and what the intention is. So we started from the point of view of going back to the principles of, of, of Kurt Hahn um, and one of his quotes um, that is oft repeated and quoted is, there is more in us than we know. Um, and I think that to us, I think all, all of us as students, as alumni, as staff and, and people within the community is something that um, we really sort of feel to the core um, to seek, to inquire, to realise our own potential, to push the boundaries of possibility within ourselves. It's, it's kind of everything that, that UWC is about. But what if this ethos applies to far more than ourselves as individuals? and is applied to our community, to the places we live and the land that sustains us. Um, you know, because at the moment, our model of education is about sending students into the world as, as sort of sophisticated and compassionate thinkers and doers, which is wonderful. Um, but could we be going much further? Um, and so this conversation is really about looking for an educational model that's founded in reciprocity, exploring and defining ourselves, both our, our value and our vulnerability, far more explicitly in relation to the people and the world around us. So really saying, you know, why Atlantic College? Why are we here in this particular place? Could we be anywhere and do the same curriculum? And, and I believe in the conversations that we've been having suggest that no, you know, this is a special place and we need to use it. We need to understand it, we need to value it and we need to let it influence our learning. Um, and so um, we started to talk about this um, as a kind of declaration of dependence, uh, an acknowledgement that service to the world needs to be rooted in awareness, nurturing our relationships with our community around us and with the land that we, we live on. A sort of reciprocity really um, and 
you know, there was a, a quote from someone who, who I'm, I've been previously very inspired by, Satish Kumar, um, who said, you are, therefore I am. And I think that's just a really lovely um, principle that an educational model at Atlantic College for the 21st century, um, when we are experiencing so much sort of turmoil in the world, rooted in a dysfunctional relationship between us as people and and our place and our land and and the idea that you know if if we in atlantic college in this such incredible site um which is at such a huge scale actually if we can't do it here then who the hell can so it's not really a question of um, you know, this would be a nice thing to do. Let's call it a, a project to grow some food in the valley in one, you know, small way. It's really, from our perspective, uh, a feeling that there's an imperative to sort of stand back and say, how can this be absolutely ingrained into the vision of the college, the, you know, the, the way in which the educational model is set up and the way in which we are living our lives as students and going into the world as alumni and staff and, and, and our whole community. So whilst we want to be really practical about the way in which this becomes manifest um, in the college, uh, we also want to make sure that there's a real understanding and a shared vision that sees this as absolutely embedded into the fiber of what the college is. So, just leaving that with with you pushing that pushing that boat out um seeing where we get to and by the end of this session what we're hoping to do is hear you know from some really interesting experiences from from everyone who's come but also to end on setting i guess a, a question so how do we take forward um some of the ideas that we've heard because we're going to move from this is the insight session and the next session we have where we're calling the ethos session so how do we then um translate the things that we've heard the ideas that have been talked about in this session into an ethos that can be incorporated within the way the college works and within the educational model um, that the college is, is seeking to move forward with and then we have a third session which is Sort of action how do we put this into practice or at least start to put it into practice and do some experimentation so i'll sit now and pass back to sean wonderful <laughs> thanks katie and and thanks to everyone who's on the call thanks you thank you so much for giving it your time thanks for joining us and and um it'd be wonderful to see how many of us can follow this flow through um i think we're being very inventive here you know last year the alumni project was obviously face to face and now we're trying to develop this small community online over a short period of intense um, days um, together, but not to take up all the days, just you know, have, have the days punctuated by this collective thinking. So that starts here and it starts with this insight session. Um, the ethos session um, tomorrow is at one o'clock um, and then the outcomes um, with the really practical session Saturday at four o'clock. So if you can be there for, for, for all three of these and bring people in um, to those um, that you know will be interested, that would be great. In addition, um, Patrick um, Holden, a great friend of the college and um, also Ben and Alice's uh, father um, who are on this call. Uh, Patrick's doing a, a, a conversation tomorrow at four o'clock, which is about his pet subject that he's phenomenally knowledgeable about around food systems. So if you're interested in that, then that will feed into it as well. So we thought today was going to be about contact, his, um, his sharing expertise and reaching out to those speakers here who've, who have um, kindly agreed to share their perspectives, reaching out to you and, and allowing you to be part of the conversation and collective thinking. And we framed a question, you know, and that is, you know, how can, can we develop a more place-based approach to learning here you know, that recognizes these different ecosystems we have at the college and of course there are environmental ecosystems but also that ecosystem these ecosystems speak to the interdependence we have with our local community and the local economies here and also the ecosystem of education as it happens here at the college within the local area and across the network of uwcs um, of which there are 18 now um, sort of around the world so hopefully we'll get to explore and touch on some aspects of this through through the um through the questions after the speakers have have um explored their particular topic areas 
So in just in terms of protocols, um, as I said before, if you type your questions in the chat, then you will pick those up. Um, we'll probably have questions after, I think it's going to be best to have questions after the speakers. So if you put the speaker's name and then your question, that'll help to direct the right question to the right speaker afterwards. Um, and I think we're recording this session, uh, Magda, is that right? It's just that the recording um, signal yes, isn't we are. So That's great. Um, so it'll be available on our social media channels afterwards. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Alice, Richard, Ashwin and Cami for, for coming and, uh, and stimulating our thoughts um, today. I'll hand over to a moment in a moment um, to Alice. Um, Alice, if you, if you want to share your screen, I'll stop sharing my screen and give you, that will give you access to everybody. And Alice, um, as she'll introduce herself, you know, is, is uh, the founder of an organisation called Growcom, which, which um, farms an acre of land, I believe, in Dagenham in East London. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing all about what you've done. And of course, students have been involved um, with this project over the years and Graham has been down there on Project Week. So hopefully students will have lots of questions and lots of insights on how we can learn from you. So um, over to you, Alice. Hi, I'm not sure how to share my screen, which is... <laughs> if I stop sharing, then you're yeah. probably going to be able to start sharing. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there should be a green button. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and um, then you to take it away. Okay. Uh, take my way, share. Um, screen. And then if you, if you click on the yeah, if you should have a dialogue box and if you if you click on the dialogue on the, the screen on the left and then select the tab that you want to show to everybody. Um, one sec, I'll get hang on. Bear with me a second. Okay. We can shift the order around if that makes if that makes it easier, um, Alice. Yeah, I'm talking. Which one are you? I just need it to be me. Oh, I don't know. Not sure you can do it on an iPad. Not sure I can do it on an iPad. I'm sure I can just wait. What are you trying to do? Show you? Yes. No. Are, are the videos? Yeah. Is that what you mean? I just want it to me be on the video. Alice, do you know what we can do? We can, we can, um, why don't we move on and then come back to you afterwards? And Sounds then good. If you, send your, if you send any images you've got to Magda or myself, and then I can, I can show them on behalf of I have of them you. ready. If it's only about no. the images, then I'm happy no. to uh, show them. I have the images ready. No. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know how to do it. I don't, I'm really sorry. Alice, um, yes. Magda has, Magda has your images if you're comfortable Fine. with that. So she can share them from her screen if, um, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah. Cool. Okay. okay, that might be easier. Sounds good. Excellent. Okay. Shall I go for it? You go for it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alice Holden and I'm the head grower of an organic vegetable farm in East London. Um, I work for an organisation called Growing Communities who are trying to help sustainable farmers grow and sell more food around and even within cities. In 2012, they acquired the lease of an East London bor Borough Council ex-nursery site um, and I got the job of trying to turn it into a viable farm. Um, with the aim of making it in all always sustainable, um, to grow produce organically and make a biodiverse farm that was productive but also financially sustainable, covering its running costs in order to be self-supporting with the hope it could be a replicable model. Here's some of our salads just in, in the image there. Um, when I started the soil was compacted and had no life in it. It was covered with either concrete sand, gravel or plastic. Initially, we brought in about 300 tonnes of organic matter, uh, composted manures, leaves, wood chip, and mostly green waste composts from the city. Any organic matter that was clean and as local as possible to us. Eight years on, the soil has life in it and it is now a productive farm and part of a thriving farm community. Last year, we produced crops to the value of 31,000 pounds. We tend to grow more 
um, crops that harvest more than once to make the most of our space. Things like salads, greens, beans, tomatoes, etc. These are all higher value and perishable. Um, things that are great to have on your doorstep so they don't have to be packed, refrigerated or travel as they normally would be if coming from further afield and thus they avoid many of the environmental costs normally associated with them. In terms of scale the farm is only 1.77 acres but of which only 1,700 metres was in production last year so under half an acre. Of this, about two thirds are covered with tunnels or greenhouses. In terms of labour, we have the equivalent of six days a week of growing labour paid. We don't have enough labour for the scale. Because of this, the techniques I use are to grow things I know that will work in a way that makes it as easy as possible to manage the crops. Every year I learn a bit more about how to do this. One of the main lessons I have learned is to focus on the soil, the depth of good fertile soil, rather than to expand too big and too fast onto the whole area. And I found I can get more yield out of the less, less area by doing this, if I focus my resources of labour and organic matter onto a smaller scale. Thinking about replicating what we do um, around term times, off 1,700 metres square of land, I, um, I harvested produce to the value of £20,000 between September and May last year, of which £14,500 was salads and other greens, all of which grow well through the colder season um, that term dates would encompass. This is the monetary value. The other values that come alongside this are harder to quantify, but of utmost importance, and they exist happily simultaneously. The farm acts as an outdoor classroom for learning about the environment, soil, climate, carbon, water, food webs. Most people come to our farm because the impact it has on their mental well-being. The physical health and food it offers is just part of a wider picture of, a, of the health it gives to the community. And just to finish, um, the food growing offers so much more than the food. If you're involved in growing the food, all the other values that nurture ourselves and our communities and our planet arise. Okay. Thank you very much indeed um, for that, Alice. That's, um, that's given us a real food for thought. Thank you so much. Um, could I call on Richard now, who's... Um, yes, indeed. Speaking from London, you, you're able to reach, introduce yourself. And I first met from Richard at the an Impact Trust um, training here at Atlantic College and was so inspired by what he's managed to achieve in his school in, um, in um, South London that he was formerly principal of, that I thought today wouldn't be complete without seeing how you've done that with, with incredible constraints, I should imagine, and you've managed to do it in, within the British state system. So hats off to you and i um, looking forward to hear what, hearing what you say. Great, thank you very much, Sean. Can you see the screen okay? Yes. Uh, that's all clear, good. Um, so thank you for that. Yes, uh, I, I think what I'm going to share will resonate a lot with what Alice has just said. Uh, I think we're at a, a very critical time right now, aren't we, in terms of uh, where we go next post COVID-19. And a lot of the conversation has been around food and how we consider relocalizing our food systems. And of course, what you're talking about at Atlantic College is a great example of what could be happening in so many places to reconnect communities and particularly young people to the land and to food growing. So I'm hopeful that we can really start to build this much more localized sense of food growing and really engage our young people in that process. Um, and as Alice said, it, it has so many benefits beyond just the, the food itself. So yeah, relocalizing our food systems a key feature. And, um, you know, in terms of this health dimension, reconnecting our young people to the land is such an important thing. And Katie, you mentioned earlier Satish Kumar, and um, he gave a talk last week on love. And I asked him a question at the end. I said, why, when we know the importance of love, do we live in such a judgmental and unforgiving world? particularly in relation to some of the things going on right now. 
And he said it's because education is in the head and it needs to be in the hands and the heart as well. And he was really clear, and I agree with him, that if our education is only head-based education, as so much of it is in an academic sense, then we lose this, this beautiful connection that we see in this picture here of children really touching the land and the soil, feeling that connection and feeling well. So if we're enlightened in our education practices, we surely need to have this element of connection to the land as a fundamental part of everything we do right the way through. Um, it was interesting, again, listening to Alice talk about, you know, biodiversity. I think, again, if you look at where we're at right now and what's going on in the, in the United States particularly, we've got a, still got a world that is not appreciating the richness of diversity and the importance of diversity to all life. And whether it's biodiversity in nature, whether it's the diversity of us as individuals, as part of a community, uh, or whether, as this image shows, it's the diversity of the food that we grow, um, these are all really important parts of healthy, sustainable, resilient systems. So I think growing in diversity is a really key part of this uh, opportunity and really exploring heritage heirloom varieties to really get us to think about the richness of, of um, diversity in our food. And of course, there's all the links to taste that go with that. Um, learning about food production, of course, is really important. Again, I, I'm not sure that our young people are learning enough about the different kinds of food systems. I'm sure Patrick will talk tomorrow a lot about organic food and farming. Um, and how that works in harmony with nature. Um, in this picture, as you can see, there's um, someone on the right called Daryl, who was the gardener of the work that we did at school. And I think it's essential uh, if this food growing is to be successful to have someone employed in a gardening role. Um, we know how demanding life is for teachers in schools and colleges. Uh, so having a person who has an overarching role for food production I think is essential. Ideally someone who gets on with the kitchen as well. Um, so then we've got this lovely link to food and cookery and growing food, harvesting food and then making food with it and one of the things we really strive to do was to bring in, particularly in the summer months, to bring in some in kind of ingredient every meal for lunchtime. So it might be some salad, it might be some tomatoes to go into a quiche something that the children or the students could see was uh, a produce that they had uh, worked very hard to grow. Um, I think it said three to five slides. I've got a couple more, but I'm nearly done. Um, the recycling of food waste is a really interesting one. Um, as you may remember, Sean, we did a lot of food recycling, not just to look at it as a process, but to close the loop, to see that one of nature's uh, key principles in terms of sustainability is this idea of cycle and cyclical practices. So uh, getting students to recycle food waste and then put it back onto the land to grow again, the, the goodness going back into the soil uh, is a really important part, not just of the food growing, but of an understanding of sustainable systems being cyclical. So yeah, in summary, I think we need to be creating cultures where food growing is an integral part of everything that we do. It's not just an add-on or an extracurricular or something that is completely missing. It's actually a fundamental part to who we are. We know, you know, we are the food that we eat message. And uh, it seems that when we get this right, then uh, our students will have a very different understanding of their relationship to the food that they eat in the world that they live in. So there we are, final experience. I think, of course, all this process needs to be a lot of hard work, uh, but enjoyable too. And, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to make learning really memorable uh, and to really engage students in something that they won't forget. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that, Richard. And, you know, what's coming through both of the presentations we've had so far is just the wide reach that food has in terms of nurturing us and 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 um and 
um, fulfilling so many other parts of, of us that are just uh, are in addition to, to what we eat, of course. And that's why it's so, such a rich test bed for curriculum. And uh, thanks for bringing that into the frame so nicely there, Richard. Ashwin, can, um, we're going to hear from an Indian perspective and, uh, and how you've been involved in this at Mahindra United World College in India. So you can take it away. Ashwin, just to remind you that you are, ah, you've just unmuted yourself. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Ashwin. I'll just start with a couple of slides about uh, what I have been doing with organic farming uh, for the last 10 years. And then I'll move on uh, to explain a few things that we have been doing at UWC Mahindra College back here in India. Um, yeah. So in 2009, uh, I had just finished my graduation, uh, my master's in horticulture at the University of Florida, and I had come back to India. Uh, and I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. Uh, but I had been massively inspired by the community supported agriculture movement, which I, which I was able to see at a very close distance in the United States. And so I decided to uh, start a CSA network uh, back home in my home city of Pune. So this is how the farm uh, was looking in 2009. Uh, it's, it's a biodiverse farm with at least 17 to 20 crops growing at any given time. You see marigold there, uh, which is planted as a trap crop. You can also sell marigold. Uh, people buy it for for religious ceremonies and things like that or for decoration um we've got drip irrigation which is probably very very common now but in back back in 2009 it was a new thing in in the little village where we were trying to farm uh, we were trellising the tomatoes with local bamboo and uh even the strings that we were using to tie the tomatoes were made from um, local jute so we were trying to use local materials as much as possible, except for the drip irrigation, I guess, which, which comes from the petroleum cycle. Um, but the idea was to basically disconnect from all mainstream um, you know, cycles of production and, and, and global consumption and keep it as local as possible. Uh, this is a picture of how we used to pack the family boxes, you know, each family had their own preferences. Um, Indians eat a lot of vegetables, a huge variety. So we used to have a minimum of 18 to 20 vegetables in each basket every week. Um, and if we did not change the vegetables, we would get complaints saying, oh, you're repeating things. So working with a CSA in, in India, which is we, we are really, you know, very, very picky about the vegetables we eat uh, was a different challenge, which I had not imagined when I was working with the CSA network in Florida. Uh, I, I just want to explain what a community supported agriculture network is and how it began very briefly. Um, as we all know, practically all agriculture on earth uh, was organic or did not use chemicals until the beginning of the industrial revolution. And it was only when we learned how to synthesize nitrogen through the Haber-Bosch process. Um, that is when it, it really changed the game because before in, when farmers were using, you know, bird poop or horseshit or even cow manure, there were intrinsic limits to how much food we could grow and uh, how much we could transport it, how much we could store it. So the whole system was kind of localized. But suddenly with the, with the ability to you know, harness as much nitrogen as we can, because the air contains 78% of nitrogen. So there was, there was endless supply of nitrogen on earth it was a question of knowing how to harness it. But once we learned that, we didn't look back. 
um, not only that, the world wars uh, actually gave us a plethora of extremely toxic, deadly pesticides, which were initially meant for the war, but were later on conveniently diverted to farming because we, we realized that we could kill a lot of pests if we, if we use these chemicals, which were basically piled up during the war and were not used. Um, so in that environment of, you know, a, a shift towards, um, you know, chemical agriculture, industrialized agriculture, mechanical agriculture from a completely organic system, um, it, it, it didn't take much time for us to max out the capacity, the fertility of our soils and to pollute our waters and of course, uh, affect our own health. It took not more than 35 to 40 years in North America and Europe to feel the impacts of chemical farming. And uh, so it was in the early 70s or late 60s that the concept of, you know, people going back to their little farms, the mom and pop farms, um, and trying to, you know, meet the demands, meet the needs of the local community. There was a resurgence of, of you know, uh, what, what Richard was saying, relocalizing our food systems. Uh, I really liked how he named his, his, his little talk, um, but that is exactly what community supported agriculture is. Um, Without dwelling too much on that, I'm going to move forward to what we did at uh, MUKI, uh, which is the United World College in India. So this is a photograph from the college. Um, I think this was 2015 when we first began to build soil. I was, I was I'm actually amazed with um, the clarity and you know simplicity with which Alice explained how she did farming. Um, on the 1.77 acres of land, I was, I was really amazed. Uh, so it all begins with soil. If you don't have good soil, you don't, you know, you can't grow anything. Uh, students, you know, uh, were kind of reluctant at the beginning to put their hands in, in piles of leaf litter and, and soil, but eventually uh, everyone had a lot of fun. This was one of the compost pits we had at the college. Um, in this photograph, you could see we were using old roof tiles, which are made with clay, um, to make a raised bed. And we, we were actually doing in situ composting in this raised bed. So there's two ways of making compost, ex situ, which is you can make it in the pit, or you can actually make a bed and start making compost as you grow things. Uh, this is a picture of, um, UWC students celebrating their farm. Uh, we had a bunch of lettuce. We were growing potato that winter. You can see some papaya and bananas in the background, some corn. So uh, sky's the limit. Uh, we were having so much fun. We still have a farm. It's, it's doing pretty well, although the size has reduced. Um, so the, the level of enthusiasm amongst um, the UWC community on our college keeps, you know, uh, varying a little bit, but there's always at least 10 to 15 students who are extremely interested in this. And that's what keeps this alive. Uh, but the point of having this, you know, alumni project week around the farm at Atlantic College was not to have just 10 or 12 students being part of this, but the entire community uh, to be part of this. Um, not only did we do farming on our campus, but we went out of campus and helped local farmers uh, in their uh, farming operations. For example, this is a shot from the monsoon of 2017, where we were helping farmers uh, to plant rice seedlings. Um, this, is the, this is a photograph of um, rice being harvested. So it's, it's a fantastic experience to to participate in a food production process from literally sowing to harvesting, but it doesn't end there. The best part is yet to come. And that is here. Uh, you can actually, uh, students at the college used to produce quite a bit of vegetables, which we, we had to sell because uh, a few of them were cooking on campus, but a lot of it had to be sold. 
we weren't producing huge quantities, but I think there was enough to, you know, sell, sell this to the faculty or some of the staff members at college. So uh, this is the one of the lawns on campus where we just set up a few tables and, and sold what we were growing on the farm. Uh, it was very informal. If there were no tables, you would just put a blanket on the floor and, and, and sell what you can. People used to bake breads and, and cakes and cookies and sell them for fundraisers. There was a lot of stuff going on and uh, we did this every Friday evening when everybody had was done with their IB and was looking forward to their weekend. Um, people made salads and, and lemonades and whatnot and it was really fun. And uh, this was a special activity which, which I always felt was extremely meaningful in the learning experience. So we had a group of about 10 or 12 students who would, you know, work regularly in the campus farm. And uh, the same group of students would organize um, a cookout every Friday evening and invite, um, you know, it was an open invitation to the whole community. People could sign up. So they would, you know, put out the menu of what they were going to cook that day. And then students would sign up and, and join in. And uh, this is one of the photographs where we, they are making idli. Idli is a South Indian uh, delicacy with, with some lentil soup. Um, um, so these are few of the things which I wanted to show, which we did at, at Muki. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you can do at AC. And these are, this is a, my last slide, which is a summary of my, you know, insights into this whole thing. And uh, as, as Richard said, we are what we eat. Um, although this, this saying has become a cliche, uh, it couldn't be more important in today's world because, you know, we often tend to forget cliches and ignore them. Um, food is what binds us to nature and soil and everything else can be manufactured artificially. So food is very special. You can't make food in laboratories. Of, I mean, some people have tried to do it, but I don't think you like the taste. Uh, we can respect and appreciate food and the people who grow it and cook it only when we grow food and we cook it ourselves. Until then, it's just something that is served on your plate and you either appreciate it or dismiss it, but you don't really understand the value of that. Um, I was the same. I, I love food and I love eating all kinds of food, but it wasn't until I grew my first tomato or my first corn that I, and I realized what it takes to do it. Uh, soil, food, and humans have always shared a spiritual bond of mutual respect and interdependence. We were talking about a declaration of dependence here. Uh, and I think that is a beautiful term that, um, you know, we are weaving this, his, this new idea around um, because we are really dependent on soil and food and uh, we often don't realize it. So for me, I think we could find a hundred reasons for not growing food at Atlantic College and not spending mon the money to get the farm back in shape or, you know, to get the, you know, uh, time, time slots available in the busy IB curriculum. We could find hundred hundred reasons, but Really, the question is very simple. Why not grow food at Atlantic College? It, it's as simple as that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ashwin. Thank you so much. That's um, you. Yeah, brilliant, really insightful and really practical and full of rich experiences. You know, it's incredible the experiences, the hands-on experiences, the relational experiences that, that students were getting that, there in that context. Thank you so much. Um, Cami? Would you like to take over and share your screen? Your screen, if Ashwin, if you stop sharing, then Cami can yeah. um, can. I'm can, trying to figure that out. That'd be great. Lovely. Okay. Did that work? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. 
Okay. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm a year 25 alumni from Pearson College in Canada, and I've been farming for the past 18 years, both on the West Coast and the East Coast of Canada. Um, with no family history in agriculture, my first foray began by taking a year-long ecological farming program at Linnea Farm on the West Coast of Canada. Linnea Farm, um, I'll share a bit about it because I think it has yeah, a lot of relevant parts of it. It's a 314 acre organic land trust, which is stewarded by people who are dedicated to sustainable agriculture, ecology, education. And for 25 years, Linnea Farm ran an ecological farming program, uh, which was designed to combine theoretical and practical learning in all aspects of small scale agriculture. Uh, so be, from participating in a working market garden and a seed company to permaculture design, woodworking, blacksmithing, seed saving, uh, its aim was to provide multi-aged learners with a foundation in ecological farming and also an alternative framework from which to transform people's relationship to food and to agriculture. So my experience at Linnea was transformational and set my life on a trajectory that's been dedicated to creating an alternative ecological agricultural reality. So following my experience at Linnea, I worked for five years uh, for a successful organic farmer in British Columbia. It was a 20 acre farm and we grew over 40 types of vegetables. It employed seven to 10 people full time and provided high quality uh, organic food for hundreds of families year round. So this experience allowed me to put the theoretical learning into practice. Um, I discovered that a highly organized and systematic approach to ecological farming can be very much financially viable and provide sustainable and meaningful livelihoods. So during that period, I returned to school to complete a master's in adult education. I did a thesis on critical and transformative adult education in agriculture. And I, created, I completed my research and practicum for my thesis back at Linnea Farm. Uh, so it was through that process that it became clear to me that meaningful education, as you've all said, develops not from the banking model of education where we pour information in, but through a combination of theory and praxis. And that was really very much clear to me. It became, I mean, it was, it, it came clear at Pearson, I think, but through an education in agriculture, it became very clear and things become, you know, very cohesive. Uh, so in 2009, I moved to a community land trust on the East Coast of Canada and began Waldegrave Farm. So for the past 12 years, I've hired three employees on a seasonal basis to grow a diversity of over 40 different types of vegetables, certified organic vegetables for my local communities. Um, we're dedicated to providing good, clean, fair food. And I'm also committed to supporting and empowering young farmers, particularly young women to do the same. Uh, for several years, I ran an apprenticeship program at the farm, which enabled me first, um, it well, which enabled first time aspiring farmers to gain both a theoretical and practical experience uh, and education in the context of a working market garden. Uh, many of these apprentices returned as employees for subsequent years, some upwards of five years, and two are currently running their own small farm business on my farm in a sort of incubator scenario. So during that period, I also became involved in the National Farmers Union and an international peasant farmer organization called Libya Campesina, which are both two incredible organizations through which I gained a political education around farming and food sovereignty. And I completely forgot to change the screens. Now, let's see if I can do it. Sorry, so this is, um, I'm gonna just backtrack a little bit. This is Linnea Farm. Uh, so these are some of the things that uh, comprise the education on Linnea Farm. Very much education of the land and of the place, um, as a lot of people have referred to, place-based education. This is my, uh, my market garden. I'm not spraying herbicides, I'm spraying compost tea. Um, so we have about four acres in production, but generally only two acres in vegetable cultivation and two acres uh, plus in cover crops and green manures each year to rebuild soil. 
this is at our market, uh, our main farmer's market in a local city. And in terms of food sovereignty, um, I think it also resonates with what, what a lot of you are referring to. It's the right of peoples, communities, and countries to define their own agricultural labor, fishing, food, and land policies, which are ecologically, socially, economically, and culturally appropriate to their unique circumstances. And it includes the true right to food and to produce food. So it's really regaining control of the food systems, as I think we're all talking about. So together, all of these experiences sh have shaped my current existence and worldview around farming and community and education. Um, and in terms of how I see ecological agriculture playing a role in the UWCs, I think it's critical and fundamental. And I think I'm really excited that AC is taking steps to get back on the land and grow food. Um, it brings everything together. It brings ecology, biology, geology, chemistry, politics, society, in a very grounded way uh, which to which everyone can relate. And I think um, in the context of a the climate crisis, the economic crisis, um, in inequality, regaining control of our food systems is essential. And I believe that the UWCs have a responsibility to help students understand food and agriculture um, and food sovereignty in this context. So I think, um, in terms of farm at AC, well, a, a caveat is that I'm a very pragmatic and practical person. So foremost, I think it has to be financially viable. Uh, I think it needs to produce food that people are willing to pay for reliably and consistently. So whether that's the college paying for it or um, as they did in uh, UWC in India, um, selling it to other people. Um, it also needs to be part of a transformation, transformative educational paradigm. And from my experience, some educational principles that it should contain are, um, are these. I think it needs to have personal meaning for students. It needs to create a supportive learning experience, learning environment. Um, responsibility, I've found through working with all kinds of different people and aspiring farmers um, and learners, adult, uh, adult learners, having responsibility for things is a major part of transformative learning experience. Uh, enabling different learning style, styles, which I think farming is really conducive to. Uh, group feelings, sharing experiences and the resources of other people, having an adaptable design that can integrate with um, curriculums, various curriculums and also allowing space for ongoing reflection and evaluation of the process. So I think that a farm on AC, whether it's in the valley or just from looking at the map, it looks like it could possibly expand beyond the valley um, into some of the other fields, should transform this, the food system of the college and the surround community, and I think it, it definitely could. Uh, it should produce good, clean, fair food, and to me that means ecologically grown, so, you know, organic high quality, fair, fair wages and prices for food. And finally, I think a big component, which is also a big component of food sovereignty is that it needs to be celebratory. Um, and uh, I think that that's a big part of empowering people to become a part of the process. Um, and I'll just leave you with this quote that I find really inspiring when I think about education, particularly, in the context of agriculture and the current, our current reality. And that's, that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cami. That was, um, that was really thorough and had so many beautiful perspectives about learning, about food, about relationships. And um, it's a really good, platform for lots of interesting questions I'm sure that will uh, that, that will arise so thank you um I can, think, I, can I just um yes, please Sean, do. Can I just okay, add for like two seconds just one yeah. other before we go into questions mm. just one other example I wanted to share I think I'd talk to a few of you about it as well um uh thanks everyone for sharing so far it's been really really inspiring I'm like really energized by it 
Um, I just wanted to share my screen very quickly um, here. Can you all see? So this is um, Brockwood Park School. Uh, unfortunately, somebody from Brockwood Park wanted to come and, and be with us today as well to share, but um, wasn't able to, they were, you know, COVID dramas and things like that. Um, but basically, um, Brockwood Park is a Krishnamurti school in, in the UK. And I just wanted to show you this particular page. I, I don't know enough about it to talk about it in detail like you all have, but I thought it was a really good example as well. Um, they have a program called Human Ecology. Um, every student is required to take part in it. Um, it's concerned with the exploration of our place in the natural world. Um, the course runs for half a morning every week and has three aims how to grow organic food and vegetables in our world garden, about local and global environmental issues and reflecting on the root causes and what it means to be in direct contact with nature, relating it to the whole body. And I, th I think Richard mentioned uh, something that Satish Kumar had said, you know, about it, education being of the, the hands and of the heart as well as of the mind. And I think that um, that, that feeling of ritual and of everybody doing it, and that's not just because we feel that it's important that everybody learns how to do farming but actually there's such a massive cultural shift from it being just a group activity that 15 students feel um motivated around rather than it be something that the whole college in in a kind of ritual way comes together around this in a, in a regular way is something that i think at brockwood i, I happen to know somebody who went there and I just went to visit a couple of times and just found it incredibly inspiring that all of the students were out in the gardens growing stuff they were all cooking all cleaning everything was just so integrated within the, the school curriculum it was it was really really impressive so I, I just wanted to share that that tiny um, sort of anecdote as well before we go into um, discussion that's, fast, that's fantastic isn't it? I love that last one, that last principle, you know, what it means to be in direct contact uh, with nature, relating it to the whole body. It reminds me of that um, Ken Robinson quote, you know, the, the body is what we use to get the brain to meetings. <laughs> it's kind of often overlooked, isn't it? You know, the integration of these things. Um, people probably need a little bit of processing and reflection time, I'd say, um, for questions to start flowing, but I'm sure there are so many um, out there um does anybody want to throw yes tanya here we go you can hear me yes uh thank you all uh very much those were very inspiring fantastic uh, talks um i just thought it might be helpful for us to know where atlantic college is at the moment because um i was there in the 80s and in the 80s they had something called a state duty I don't know if they have that anymore. It was, it was a service. It was a state duty service. So maybe the word duty should be left out. It was a state service. And numerous of the students belonged to state service and they did things with husbandry, um, cat, uh, you know, animal husbandry, and also grew um, vegetables and were involved in looking after the estate. And we were very aware of when food was produced on the estate and brought into the kitchens. We were also very aware that a lot of our milk came from the um, supply that was involved there and, uh, you know, from the estate. And we all had turns to sign up for estate activity. So we were encouraged if we didn't do a, um, so myself, I was a, a, in Cliff Rescue and um, I know those services don't, aren't there anymore, but it, it brought me very much in touch with um, an environment of the elements and through all through the year, good and bad weather. And we were then very much encouraged to do activities that were outside of something we may have done as our service. So that was really good because it forced us to do things that, um, you know, were challenging. And, and I went lambing. I, I signed up for lambing estate activity in the winter, which was the first time I'd assisted in a lamb's birth and witnessed a lamb birth. Um, I grew up in Zimbabwe in the bush, so I, I was very... Um, one with um, nature, but this was a totally different experience because I'd never had a farm experience. 
And the other thing to it was, it was the first place I learned to forage. Um, we were taught to forage. I had never ever known which flowers you could eat and couldn't. And we were taught by people who worked on the estate, this type of thing. And to this day, I still do that type of thing. Um, I then became a farmer's wife and I worked um, with my, my um, ex-husband and I ran a farm in South Africa for 14 years. And it was born, a lot of my um, passion was born at Atlantic College for understanding where food came from. So I just thought it might be a really good thing to, for us to know where, so, so for me, I didn't know this had not happened. I felt very one with it. And, and I, 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 I'm, um, I can't say I have a skill to offer to these sessions other than I do think that if Nash Point uh, lost its foghorn, I'm a very good foghorn. I have a voice that could be heard across the plains of Savannah. I've always said that. And I can think of three people who come to mind who I will definitely try and engage um, in the rest of the session who, are, who were at, at college with me, did estate duty, and to this day are still very involved in the type of things we're discussing now. Um, so I will be a foghorn and I will, uh, I will promote the cause, but Brilliant. thank you. Tanya, thank you so much. And you've asked a very valid question as well as giving those, um, those, those insights. Uh, Sam, um, would you like to... And maybe respond to that in terms of where we're up to at the moment me, with the land. There we go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Tanya. Um, thanks so much for asking that, that question. Um, I'm the co-curricular coordinator here, so I thought it would just be um, worth me giving you an overview of where we're at at the moment. And we still do have what we call campus care service. Um, and that comprises of um, some uh, gardening, of uh, growing vegetables in the valley, um, of building service. So we still very much have those services here. I think what we're looking to harness is to develop them further. And I think particularly with what's happening with climate change and also with um, more recently with the pandemic as there's just been this real focus on where suddenly people can't get food um, and where, where is it coming from and um, certainly locally here and I, I, I'm sure this is the case for many of you but I'm just describing sort of what's happened for us in a microcosm here is that um, the the true heroes recently have been our local food producers people that Polly and Ben know at Slade's Farm, um, who suddenly, you know, they've been fighting for years to produce um, wonderful organic food and, and get customers and all of a sudden they've got customers desperate um, because they are local, they are good quality food. And I think um, everything that, that people have said about getting back on the land and uh, this nature deficit disorder and reconnecting again has just sort of gathered momentum over all of this so what we're looking to do i think is really enhance our service um, to understand further just how much we can do on the area that we have um, we've got very dedicated um, staff members like graham i know is on the call he's been working um, extremely hard in the valley to keep it to a standard for when the students come back um, and so it looks inspirational down there right now, I, I have to say. I know PT's on the call as well, he's also been working hard. But I think one thing that I mentioned on the planning meeting last week, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but one thing that um, I particularly picked up on from um, Ashwin that we're missing out on at the moment is the the, the end result for the students so they're doing all of these wonderful things they are being involved we do need to get more energy behind it and we do need to get more students involved in getting their hands dirty and, and getting involved in the valley but I think we also need to provide them with that end result of being able to sell their produce in the shop sell it to each other sell it to staff see it going into the kitchen at the moment it does go into the kitchen um, but I, I, sometimes I just feel it's not visible enough for them. And we all know, don't we, as adults, we still have to make ourselves do things sometimes, knowing the end result will be good. For me at the moment, it's exercise. Like I really have to make myself do it. Knowing the end result, I will be, I will be glad of it. And I think that's something we really have to scaffold for them and support them in um, to understand that working in Wales on the land through the winter um, it is 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 hard graph but at the end of that 
the, when they produce wonderful bags of winter salad and they're selling them to each other in in our shop or or however we whatever vehicle we provide for that is is really important as well so it's building on what we're doing and, and enhancing where we're at lovely thanks thanks sam that's um that's, that's great and i'm sure some of those themes will be unpacked uh, tomorrow and, and on saturday jack you've got um you've got another question um yeah i had a, had a question i think for perhaps for ashwin and richard um just when we were talking to a, a current uh, and the students um, when we were talking to one of the students um last week thinking about this they brought up a, a an idea a concept that i had never thought of before and that was um, the difficulty of overcoming um, the stigma and in some ways the shame associated with working on the lands that a lot of students coming from um, from around the world um, and sometimes from agricultural communities might bring and I, I was just wondering what your experiences were it sounds like Ashwin this is something you you've tackled but I'm sure you have Richard too and just sort of getting students sort of over the conceptual hump that you know working with the land can be something that's exciting and engaging and not filled with not filled with shame not a backward step thanks jack ashwin do you want to take, take that first or jim or richard ashwin do you, want to, do you want to go first on that unmute okay yeah uh, I think, Jack, I've seen a little bit of both at uh, Mahindra College. Uh, I've seen people, students from developing countries who, who, who've always been farming, helping out their parents back home. Uh, they come to UWC and uh, some of them tend to prefer gas activities that, that they have never done in their lives. And, uh, and the simple logic is like they've been farming all their lives. Uh, what what new thing would they learn by you know working on this small farm on campus? So that is one thought process. But the other one I have seen is some students who were who had always been exposed to farming back home, in fact enjoy it so much that they they look at it as you know meditation or just you know reconnecting with with their with their home a little bit. Um, seen a bit of both. Um, the feeling shameful part, yes, I think there is some merit in, in that, um, you know, asking that question, but I, I kind of feel that um, this, this generation has moved past that. I think they are very clear about what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And um, I think it's a question of, um, you know, creating the excitement around the farm once again. And, and not not really worry about this the shame part. I think these kids are, are smarter than that. Um, although Jack, I, I may be wrong. <laughs> That's nice, Ashwin. And I think celebration helps with that. That came through um, clearly in what Cami was saying, you know, building up that center ground of, of common endeavor, you know, through celebrating the work. Uh, Richard, do you want to add, add, add to that from your perspective? Yeah. Just, just a couple of things. Um, one, I, I think, to follow on from what Ashwin was saying, uh, there's an interesting organisation at the moment called Teach the Future, which is about young students uh, demanding a better way of learning for their future. Um, and they're very clear that they want a much more integrated, real-life, applied way of learning. And, of course, food is such an integral part of that. So I would concur with what Ashwin is saying, that I think a lot of young people... Uh, are just questioning what their learning is for and and food and farming is is a good part of that not not a negative thing of course it it needs to be sensitively managed um, but this is about good real life learning if it's done well um, and I think there are opportunities to value their contributions through that process um, if they're keen to you know to offer that um, so yes it does need a lot of sensitive management if it's necessary and if it's you know a, a sensitive area for particular students uh, but I think if it's done with that in mind and in a positive way I think it can be uh, something that can enrich the learning actually uh, in a good mm -hmm. way um, and sure. so it's an integral part of where students I think are seeing their learning going now absolutely and yeah and that's yeah and, and what an opportunity that AC has to 
have those spaces within the curriculum that you know that don't have to be contested and fought over in the way that some schools have to. Uh, Cami. Sorry, um, I just had one short comment. I think um, I agree with the kind of celebratory and, and helping people feel pride in their work through through celebration. Um, one thing, I don't know if it would be useful or maybe you've thought of it already, but um, I guess a question comment, how much space do you have? Can you expand beyond that, the little valley into some of the fields? And also when I, like in my work with Linnea, um, a piece that seemed to be through through my work with the students there um, are really enriching and, and yeah, transformative part of it was people being able to have independent plots. So it was kind of like a community gardens for the students in a way, although they were bigger than just a bed and they allowed, um, uh, there was a certain amount of guidance in terms of people having to, you know, suggest a plan and what they were going to explore, what they hoped to learn through their own particular plots. And some people pursued more vegetable production or flower production or medicinal production. But they had a, there was a kind of a guided process, but they had a significant size plot which allowed for a lot of personal learning and um, pride and development in that space. Lovely thought. A really lovely thought. And that um, brings us almost to planning tomorrow's ethos session. And before I do that, before we get onto that, um, are there any students who'd like to give their perspective from the from the world of land sustainability and everything else that you've been doing? Kato. And unmute. Hello. 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 Um, well, like I heard about um, motivation. Um, and I've been thinking about like what CAS is going to be next year. That was the first thing that I thought of because there's so much uncertainty about what we are able to do with Corona. Um, so we don't know if we're allowed to go off campus, which allows for the students to really focus on the campus and do stuff on the campus itself. Um, so I actually think that next year is going to be very promising for the valley and that students are going to be much more invested and about like getting students to be motivated i remember this one class with graham um where we just abolished the entire lesson and just talked about experimental learning and growing food and at the end of the lesson me and i think 10 other students were just so incredibly hyped up that we just sat together and created this plan of what we wanted to change about ac or like the experimental part about ac and it was very ambitious um but um like having teachers just kind of really putting in like putting attention towards the valley and kind of incorporating it in class like class discussions it was really really awesome like i just felt that like the whole class was just like yes let's do this let's get more into the valley and stuff um so i'm actually really hopeful that next year is going to be like really productive for like the valley and maybe it will be a good year to kind of explore the possibilities with the valley because we're all kind of closed down on campus and we can't really you know go out to Cardiff and we have to be really mind, like mindful of what businesses we support because of COVID and like where we get our produce so yeah. I'm hopeful. Yeah. That's a great perspective thanks so much Kato and I think um, we, we've got two minutes left and um, great so I'm just about to say that leads us on nicely to, to, to thinking about ethos which you've raised so nicely. Kate you had your hand up, hand up would you like yeah, to? Yeah because I just I I just wanted to say how, how glad I am what Kato said. It's actually really what I wanted to hear because we were talking to Sam and others about what next year will bring in terms of, you know, residential homes and other services. We will not be able to visit most probably and school sessions and refugees and so on. So many valuable service sessions, but, but we are hoping to use the valley and the campus and the new curriculum development opportunities for this. So it's uh, it's not a nice way to say what I said, but but at least this is the it's not don't quote it the positive impact of COVID. So so for us, yeah, what <clears throat> opportunities it will give us. So I am really glad uh, to hear what she said. 
that's nice. And um, and Katie, you were talking about the importance of, of building culture and ethos around that, and having a kind of common sense of, of of purpose, which is a great a great departure point, I think, for thinking about tomorrow's sessions. Um, Katie has scribed some some questions so far, and Ed, you were diligently taking notes through that, and so I just wonder whether you'd like to. Um, summarise or, or um, suggest any questions that seem to be emerging to lead us into into the ethos session. Um, sure, could you just outline exactly what the ethos session is? Good point. So today we've been inspired and thank you so much um, for inspiring us all our, our four speakers in case you don't get a chance that, to say that before we, uh, before we sign off. And the purpose of this was to, to give us new thoughts, new perspectives. Um, tomorrow it's about um, how do we develop a set of principles and common understandings, values, ethos around what we do? So not what, do, what, what, what the steps um, A, B and C in order to get there, but what are the underlying values um, that we need to um, approach this task and these possibilities with? Katie, would you add anything to that? I mean, yeah, I think, your I think in particular, I think what we've heard from everyone, it was really great to hear from Tanya, actually, because that was our experience. You know, we had people getting up in the middle of the night going to help lambs be born and, you know, all kinds of things like that. It felt very rooted. Um, and there's this probably a kind of cyclical thing where, you know, these activities wane and maybe it's time to, you know, bring them back to the fore a little bit. But I think that, um, one thing that is really, really important is that everybody's sort of described, I think, activities going on in the campus that are really valuable, but are slightly fragmented. So for me, the, the key question is, how do we bring these ideas that we've all been talking about? How do we bring this to something that is shared by the whole college, that is something that is, is being talked about from from the principal to the cleaners to the people in the kitchens to everybody working on the land to the students everybody that this is something that is felt as an intrinsically you know essential part of college life and so for me i'm interested in the que the key question tomorrow being what is the mechanism by which we 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 bring that culture shift about around you know um is it by making it a key part of the curriculum um that everybody spends time you know in the land as part of their learning experience is that it's a service is it that it's you know there's all kinds of ways in which it could be manifest it could be one of those things it could be all of those things but i think there's a there's a certain degree to which um we need to sort of work out how we want to bring people together. I mean, Cami just made a really lovely um, suggestion around um, a harvest festival. Maybe it's about ritual and having regular things. So not everybody's doing it all the time, but there's sort of regular comings together um, at key points in, in, in the year. So there's, there's all kinds of different ways in which that could happen that I, you know, I haven't got fully formed. So I'm, I'm imagining that the purpose of tomorrow really is to think about the fact that we've had all these really amazing insights today and that all of you will have brought from all of your other experiences and to think about now specifically talking about the college how do we really imbue the whole of college life with a sense of this the importance of our, our place in the land that's good that, that's lovely there's a there's a lot of sentiment in terms of bringing graham in can i because we've gone over time um, can I suggest that Graeme you start tomorrow by showing your film um, because that, that we intend that to kick start the the ethos session. Graeme's made a, a lovely film that just brings just shows the work the current work of uh, that's been happening that he's been leading there in the valley um, and that might be a really good starting point for, for tomorrow's um, discussion. Pete and um, Ed would you like to would you like to add to anything because I know you've been describing. No I think I couldn't have put it better myself I mean I I wonder some of the principles I've just written down are sustainability, both financial and ecological, some idea of ritual and celebration and participation from the whole community, 
those are perhaps some foundational principles that could be discussed. I think also what, what Sam and I think both Sam and Tanya talked about, I think everybody talked about, but that idea of cycle of the students and the whole community seeing literally the fruits of the fruits of their labor in some form and, and the being a kind of uh, that we really, really identify what are the cycles, what are the closed loops that we want to um, really make happen on campus and make manifest and really sort of make it so that everybody understands their role in, in these cycles from beginning to end. I think also just it was great hearing uh, Cato's thoughts because it sort of reminds me of what I loved about Atlantic College, which was it was a place where as a student you could have ideas and be creative and make things happen. And it strikes me that there's so many elements of sort of planning out rituals, planning out food to grow where like as a student you could be you would feel empowered you know it gets to that real Kurt Hanian principle of you know allowing students to um to discover themselves through through their ideas through through the community fantastic that seems like a good place to to sign off for today um one o'clock tomorrow those of 